Welcome to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On Snoozecast, we read excerpts from public domain works and, occasionally, original stories. Listen to us on snoozecast.com, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Spotify and Instagram. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please subscribe and write us a review on the Apple Podcasts app or wherever you listen. Also, share it with a friend. This episode is brought to you by Liberation. Tonight, we'll be reading a story called The Adventures of a Spanish Nun from the Strange Storybook by Mrs. Andrew Lang, published in 1913. This story tells of a young woman who had been raised in a convent, but had dreams of exploring the world. She then acts upon them, dressed as men, and is full of exploits and daring. Adventures of a Spanish Nun. If you had visited the convent of St. Sebastian in the Spanish town of the same name at the end of the 16th century, you would have found there a merry, naughty, clever little girl called Catalina de Arauso, the torment and delight of all the nuns. Catalina had been sent to the convent when she was quite a baby because her father, like many other gentlemen in the Spain of those days, was too poor to provide for his daughters as well as his sons. And in general, the girls were happy enough in the life into which they had been thrust without any will of their own and were allowed a certain amount of pleasure and could see their relations from time to time. The Señor de Arauso, Catalina's father, had fixed on this particular convent out of the many he had for choice because his sister-in-law was the mother superior. Like the rest of the nuns, She was very fond of the child who was so ready with her tongue, so clever with her hands, so quick to forgive an injury done her, if only the offender would say she was sorry. Someday, no doubt, Catalina would take her place as abbess, and her aunt felt that under her rule all would go well, for unruly as the child often was, she had the gift of winning love from everybody. But if she had only known, Catalina had not the smallest intention of spending her days in the convent overlooking the Bay of Biscay. From her father and brothers, she heard stories of the wars which had quite lately been raging in France between the Catholics and Huguenots, how a few years earlier several of her own kinsmen had gone down in the great storm which had sunk so many of the ships of a huge armada sent to conquer England. Something, too, she picked up 
of the wonders of the lands beyond the ocean, discovered a hundred years ago by Christopher Columbus. All this and much more Catalina stored in her head, and, though she said nothing even to her closest friends, soon began to play in her mind at escaping from the convent. At first, she was only in fun and enjoyed, as many of us do, making up stories about herself. Then, gradually, the idea of taking part in the big world beyond the gates became too precious to set aside, and at last it so possessed her that she only waited for the chance of carrying it out. This happened when she was fifteen, a tall, strong, handsome girl full of energy and courage, and quick to decide whatever question came before her. One day, the nuns assembled as usual for vespers or evening prayers, and just as they were all going into chapel, the superior discovered that she had left her psalm book upstairs locked in her writing table. Summoning Catalina, she handed her a key and bade her unlock the drawer in which the book was kept and bring it to her as fast as possible. The girl ran upstairs, but when she saw lying in the locked drawer not only the book, but the key of the convent gate. It darted into her mind that now, if ever, was her opportunity to quit the convent. Yet even at that moment, she did not let her excitement get the better of her. She snatched up some loose money from the drawer and a small work case that lay on a table and hid it in her dress, and without stopping a moment, ran down to the great door of the convent, which she unlocked. She next rejoined her aunt, who was waiting for her, and asked if she might go straight to bed, as she had a bad headache. In this manner, she secured to herself a good start, as no one would think about her for hours to come. She passed through the door carefully, locking it after her, and crept cautiously along by the wall till she reached a chestnut wood on the outskirts of the town. Here she flung herself down on a heap of dry leaves and slept till sunrise. This, fortunately for her, was very early, as she had much to do before she continued her journey. Her dress would have told any passerby that she was a nun, or at least that she had come from a convent and that was the last thing they must ever guess. Slipping off, therefore, her white petticoat, Catalina began at once to turn it into trousers, such as men then wore, and in three or four hours had finished a pair which, if not exactly fashionable, would pass unnoticed. She next managed to change her long robe into a cloak, and satisfied that she would do well enough, the girl started on a walk to a town not far off, where she had resolved to try and find shelter 
with an elderly cousin. It took her two days to arrive at his house, and all that time she had nothing but wild fruits and berries to live on. Of course, she did not tell the cousin who she was, but merely asked if he would give hospitality to a traveler for a short time which the kind old man was glad to do. Here, Catalina rested after the fatigues she had undergone, but life in the townhouse was far more dull than life in the convent, and the girl had not run away for that. So, in a few days, she was again missing, and a handful of dollars also. Not very many, but just enough to take her on her way. We meet Catalina next in the famous city of Valladolid, where King Philip III was holding his court. Here she found things much more to her taste, and like what she had pictured. Men were walking through the streets in huge felt hats, with flowing cloaks over their fine clothes. Coaches drawn by mules jolted along, and inside she caught a glimpse of ringletted heads and small bodies lost under hooped petticoats. There were soldiers, too, in abundance, and bands playing music, the first Catalina had ever heard outside the convent chapel. It so delighted her that she stopped to listen, and at that moment some idle men began to laugh at her clumsy garments and even threw stones at her. This was more than any Spanish girl could bear, even if she had been brought up in a convent. She could, and did, throw stones too, with a better aim than theirs, and very soon blood from cut heads was streaming on the roads. But the Spanish police who hurried to the spot on hearing the cries of the wounded men, did not stop to inquire into the rights of the quarrel, and would have straightway flung Catalina into prison, had not a young officer who had been watching the fight from his windows hastened to interfere, and insisted that the stranger should be released. You are a brave boy, he said and if you'd like to be my page, I will gladly take you into my house. Catalina was very grateful for the offer and remained there for three months, feeling very proud of herself in her page's dress of dark blue velvet. She would have stayed with the young Dawn for much longer had she not been frightened out of her wits one night at dusk by the appearance in the dark little anteroom where she sat of her own father. He did not know her, of course. How should he? But all the same, he had come to tell of her escape to Catalina's master, who was in a sort of way Lord of the convent. Waiting in the anteroom, the girl heard all their conversation, and in dread lest she should fall into the hands of the church and be sent back to St. Sebastian, she resolved to run off before there was any risk of her being traced. Now, At that time, a fleet was being fitted out for Peru and was to sail from a seaport in the south.
the scraps of talk on the subject which she had overheard in the house of the young Don had fired her with the wish to go with the army in search of adventures. At the time, there seemed little chance of her doing so. But while crossing the dark streets of Valladolid in her flight, the idea occurred to her that if she could manage to get on board one of the ships, she would be out of reach of capture. It was a long way to travel, almost the whole length of Spain. But by joining first one party and then another, Catalina at last found herself in the port of San Lucar. All volunteers were welcome, and convent bred though she was, Catalina soon managed to pick up a good deal of seamanship, while her clever hands and her strength combined and made her quickly useful. Even with fair winds, it was months before they reached the coast of Peru, for which they were bound. And when they were almost there, their troubles began. A frightful storm arose that blew the fleet in all directions, and the vessel in which Catalina was serving was flung on a coral reef. The sea was running high, and the ship had a deep hole in her side, and all on board knew that twenty-four hours at farthest would see her sucked beneath the water. At the prospect of this awful doom, the sailors grew frantic, and hastened to lower the longboat and scramble into it. The captain alone refused to leave the ship, and Catalina refused to leave him. Instead, she hurriedly lashed a few spars together so as to form a raft, which, even if it would not support the weight of both, would at least give them something to cling to while they swam ashore. As she was working at the raft with all her might, a vivid flash of lightning showed an enormous wave breaking over the distant boat and sweeping away the crew who disappeared forever. A fit of despondency had seized on the captain and it was in vain that the girl tried to put some of her own spirit into him. At length, she realized that she had only herself to depend on and left him alone. As soon as the raft was ready, she went down to his cabin and broke open a box of gold out of which she took a handful of coins, tying them up in a pillowcase and fastening them securely to the raft, for she dare not put them on her own person, lest the weight should sink her once she found herself in the sea. The moment... Catalina appeared again on deck. She saw that the ship was sinking fast and that no time was to be lost. She lowered the raft and, calling to the captain to follow her, plunged into the sea. He obeyed her but did not give the vessel a sufficiently wide berth, and
hand, falling against a jutting spar, was struck senseless and sucked under the vessel. Catalina had managed better. She contrived to get on the raft and was gently washed on shore by the rising tide, though she was too much exhausted by all she had gone through to have been able to swim there for herself. For a while, she lay upon the sand, almost unconscious, but the hot sun which appeared suddenly above the horizon, warmed her body and dried her clothes and awoke her usual energy. She soon sat up and looked about her, but the prospect was not cheering. A desolate track stretched away north and south, and she did not know on which side stood the town of Paita, whither the fleet had been bound. However, she reflected she would never find it by sitting still, and got up and climbed a rock to enable her to see farther. Great was her joy at beholding that the raft with the money on it had stuck in a cleft some way off along the beach. And after she had placed the coins in her own pockets, she perceived a barrel of ship's biscuits at a little distance. To be sure, The biscuits were half soaked with seawater, but even so, they tasted quite nice to a starving girl. A walk of three days brought her to Paita, where she bought some fresh clothes and obtained a situation as clerk to a merchant. But she did not keep this very long as she incurred the jealousy of a young man who owed money to her her employer. He picked a violent quarrel with Catalina, who had to fight a duel with him. Without intending to kill him, her sword passed through his body, with the result that she soon found herself in the hands of of the police. By a mixture of cunning and good fortune, Catalina managed to escape from the prison in which she was confined. And making her way through the narrow streets to the harbor, she got into a small boat moored there and hoisted a sail. She was afraid to use the oars, and she had no means of muffling them. The wind was behind her, and she was quickly swept far out to sea, in what direction she had not the least idea. For hours, she saw nothing and was wondering if she had escaped so many dangers only to die of hunger and thirst. When towards sunset, she beheld a ship coming straight across her path. With her heart in her mouth, She waved her handkerchief, though it seemed hardly possible that so small a thing should be visible 
in that vast expanse of sea. But it was, and the ship lay too, waiting for the boat to be blown up to her, which happened just after the sun had set beneath the horizon and the short twilight of the tropics was over. Then it occurred to Catalina that if the name of her boat was seen, she might be traced as having come from Paita and be given up for murder. So, standing up, she rocked it gently from side to side till it was filled with water, then giving it a final kick to make sure it would sink, snatched at the rope which was dangling down the ship's side and was hauled on board. The vessel was on her way to Chile and was filled with recruits for the war then raging with the native people. And Catalina, of course, at once declared her wish to throw in her lot with them. When at length they arrived at the port for which they were bound, a cavalry officer came to inspect the newly enlisted soldiers before they were landed, and Catalina was startled to hear him addressed by her own name. It was, though he was quite aware of it, her eldest brother, who had last seen her when she was three years old. Yet, though from first to last he never guessed the truth, he took an immediate fancy to Pedro Diaz, for so Catalina called herself. And as soon as he heard that Pedro was a native of his own province of Biscaya, greeted him kindly and placed him in his own regiment. But much as she longed to tell him who she was, she dared not do so. For who could tell if it were once known that she was a woman? <laughs> <laughs>